your hand here this morning. We are going to be uh, truly going through as these attributes of God. We are going through this morning uh, the power of God, the power of God. Uh, It's wonderful when you stop and you think about it, but the Apostle Paul uh, wrote in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Did you catch that? Verse 20, Romans 1. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. This morning we're talking about his eternal power. Centuries and centuries ago, God promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. And uh, they mentioned, God told them that the offspring... uh, that would come from this child would be immense in number and that the world would truly be blessed. However, there were problems. Abraham and Sarah, as you know, were very old. And Sarah had never had a child at this point in time. And so you wonder about the promises of God. When Abraham was told that his wife Sarah would have a child, Abraham thought to himself, yes, that's, that's going to be really, really difficult, God. And when Sarah heard it, you remember what her reaction was. She laughed and she thought to herself, yeah, right, that's never going to happen. And the Lord, the Bible says, I'm in Genesis chapter 18, verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am old? And then the word of God says this, and God says this about himself, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Is anything too hard for me? At the appointed time I'll return, and at this time next year Sarah shall have a son. Well, we know that indeed that was the case. Sarah did have a son, and uh, God was demonstrating his tremendous, tremendous power. I don't know about you, but I believe that the omnipotency of God, as it were, is extremely vital for all of us to stop and comprehend. We all need to think about how powerful God is. We need to stop and consider the awesome power of God. I need to know that my God is all-powerful. Are you with me? I need to know that for a number of reasons. And it was something that was never lost on the people of Israel. For God always wanted his children, his chosen ones, the people of Israel, and also for us, the church, and ultimately for the entire world, to know that there is no one like him, that he is truly all-powerful. There was a story once about how God was approached by a scientist who said, listen, uh, we've decided we don't want God around anymore, and, and so he told God, he said, uh, we can clone people, transplant organs, do all kinds of things, uh, genetics and so forth, um, and uh, things that used to be miraculous, uh, the scientist said, we just uh, don't need you anymore, we can do it all. So God replied, well, you don't need me. He said, uh, how about we put your theory to the test? Why don't we have a competition to see who can make a human being, a male human being? And the scientist uh, agreed. And so God uh, declared that they should do it like they did it back in the good old days when he created Adam. Fine, says the scientist, as he bends down to scoop up a handful of dirt. God turns to the scientist, he says, whoa, 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 shaking his head in disapproval. Not so fast, he says. Get your own dirt. (laughs) God is truly all-powerful. He is without a doubt, demonstrated his power over and over again. When Jesus was teaching, he taught the uh, disciples that it was very difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he said it was easier for a camel to go through what? The eye of the needle. And the disciples turned to Jesus and they said, well, then who possibly can be saved? Jesus turned and he said what? With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I want you to understand with me this morning how significant the power of God is. And there are two things in the Old Testament, two main events in the Old Testament that point to the all-powerful 
God who we worship. There are many things, I could, I could go on and on, and I have no idea how I'm going to get through all my notes here this morning, even in this allotted time. We could talk about a miracle after miracle that took place in the Old Testament, could we not? There are many. We could think about Jonah. Isn't it incredible that he's swallowed by a huge fish and then spit up on dry ground? Isn't that amazing? Well, sure it is. It's chicken feed compared to the two things, though, in Scripture that really point to the power of God. Think of Balaam and the donkey, and how about that talking donkey? Is that pretty cool or what? I mean, our dogs don't even obey us. Never mind, speak. But can you imagine God was able to do something as amazing as that? That's nothing. That's nothing. You say, well, how about King David when he got a hold of those stones, and with his sling he swung it around and hit that old Goliath right in the middle of the head and killed him dead. Isn't that an amazing miracle? Oh, yeah. But it's nothing compared to the other things that God's done. When the people of Israel thought about the power of God, they thought about two main events. One is creation itself. Take your Bibles and go with me to to Genesis chapter 1. The creation shows the power of God. In Genesis chapter 1, we have here a reference to creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in verse 1. The Bible says the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning and that was one day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above. And it was so. And God called the expanse the heaven. And there he was, and there was evening, and there was morning, and then there was a second day. God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters. He called the seas and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in them and their kind, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser to govern the night. He made the stars also. What was the great light? Two great lights, he says, one to govern the day. What's that? The sun. And uh, the one at night is the moon. Isn't that amazing? Uh, it, it's just incredible. But God did this all with foresight, and he did it all with planning. So God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Let the waters teem with swimming living creatures and let birds fly above the earth. And God created the great sea monsters, every living creature that moves. You remember the sea monsters, the Leviathan. And uh, we have the, the reference there uh, with regard to Job. And Job, what have you done? Can you even put a hook in that thing's mouth? And the obvious answer was absolutely not. You see, the references here uh, are to these living creatures that God has created. Verse 22, God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply in the earth there was evening there was morning this was a fifth day and God said let the earth bring forth living creatures and you get all the living creatures and God saw that it was good and then God said let's make man in our image and you have man who is created and God says in verse 27 he created man in his own image in the image of God he created him and he told him to be fruitful and multiply verse 31 here in chapter 1 this last verse says God saw all that he had made That includes man, that includes the animals, that includes the plants, that includes the sun and the moon, the stars. He says everything that he has made, and it was very good. It was very good. 
And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And what did God create on the seventh day? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. Silence. And God rested from his creation. Now, what is so amazing about uh, creation, and it's referenced in Scripture over and over again. Take your Bible and go with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 33. As a young boy, when I was in Sunday school and we learned about God creating the heavens and the earth, it was absolutely uh, plausible in my mind. I fully got the understanding of Genesis chapter 1. Isn't that amazing that God could say, let there be light, and there was light. And I was amazed by that. When I come to Psalm chapter 33, verse 6, it says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You see, God, I believe, created by speaking into existence the world as we know it. I believe that our God is capable of doing that. Uh, That was normally the case when I grew up as a Christian young man. It was understood that God did that. And you read in several places in the scripture that God was able to create out of nothing all that we have here. And that's the whole point there. God created in that joke about the dirt. Whoa, get your own dirt. The idea there is that God was the one who was able to create out of nothing all the substance of this world. And there have been all different types of theories that have come against the record here in Genesis chapter 1. I remember in the Schofield Bible, in the Schofield Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, uh, they came and they put notes in the Bible saying that there was between 1 and 2 a gap, and the gap was millions of years old. And there was a whole nother subset of people who lived during this period of time. God got ticked off at them and smashed them, and that's what happened. Then he started all over again in verse 2. I'll tell you, if God was the kind of God that did that, He'd have smashed and started a bunch more times than that, don't you think? (laughs) I mean, realistically. But the whole problem was, the reason why Schofield, who was trained as a lawyer, by the way, uh, why he came up with that was because of the difficulty trying to explain the fossils. He said, you know, uh, if we do this and we create a gap between chapter, or verse 1 and verse 2, we can actually have a, a, a period of time there that will explain to scientists Uh, the fossils that we're finding. Now, creation scientists have been working on this, and they've got answers for all of it now. It's pretty amazing. I I didn't need those answers. I'm going to be totally honest with you, because I came to the scriptures by faith, and I am absolutely fine with the reality that if God spoke it into existence, I believe that God can speak it into existence. I don't need any further uh, education or application. When I took uh, Genesis in seminary uh, in a Hebrews class, a Hebrew class, uh, they taught us uh, that there could not be a gap between verse 1 and 2 because of something that was known grammatically as a while consecutive, where you would translate then. My New American Standard Bible does translate it then. Then God did this. Then God did this. And there's absolutely no way that you can jam in between verse 1 and verse 2 another whole uh, creation of man. But people will do whatever they can possibly do uh, to be able to, I shouldn't say save face, but that's almost what it is, to become more um, uh, in line with science uh, today. Now, I have a problem with that because I come to God's word and I come by faith. And if God's word says that he spoke it into existence, I am absolutely fine with that. I find it fascinating in the scriptures that as I look at this, uh, that God creates all of the vegetation. And it has seeds in it, and it's bearing fruit. Isn't that great? I mean, that's great. You know how hard it is to grow stuff? I mean, seriously, if you're not a farmer, you know how hard it is to grow stuff. 
it is very tricky to grow things. God creates all this, and he creates it with seeds inside. We might not like our watermelon seeds, but the truth of the matter is God put them there so that there'll be watermelons in the future for other people too. Isn't that great? God thought of everything. Well, isn't it amazing? But if you come to the passage here and you say, well, yes, Pastor Kevin, there were six days where God created, but I believe that every single day was actually a long period of time. So let's say millions of years. We won't go billions because that's McDonald's. We're going to just go millions. So in millions of years, what would happen to your garden if it never had any sunlight? (laughs) You wouldn't grow anything, would you? Because God creates the sun and the moon the day after he creates the fruit trees and the vegetation always made me wonder about the day-age theory. The day-age theory that, well, you know, yes, there's six days, but they're all millions of years. God, I think you got it out of order. You see, if you really wanted to create something with a day-age, you'd have to create the sun and the moon first before you'd create the, the vegetation, wouldn't you? You say, well, that's a small thing, but it's really not a small thing when you stop to consider it. Along comes evolution and all of the ideas about the survival of the fittest. And you know Darwin and all the things that are said there. Um, A prominent 20th century evolutionist by the name of Stephen Jay Gould had this to say about the necessary natural selection component of all evolutionary process. He said, moreover, natural selection expressed in inappropriate human terms is a remarkably inefficient, even cruel process. Selection carves adaptation by eliminating masses of the less fit, imposing uh, hedicombs of death as preconditions for limited increments of change. Natural selection is a theory of trial and error externalism. Organisms propose via their storehouse of variation and environments dispose of nearly all, not an efficient and human goal-directed internalism, which would be a fast and lovely, but nature does not know that way. Evolution, if it's used by God in any form, charges the creator with waste and cruelty. Stop and think about it. If it's all about survival of the fittest, if there's such a thing as theistic evolution, then we have God who is being cruel. And yet you look at Genesis chapter 1, and after every single day when God creates, the Bible says God said, it is what? Good. And the last verse of Genesis chapter 1, it was very good. God makes a point of saying, I've created this. There's no sin in the world. How wonderful this truly is. Now, imagine how powerful our God is if indeed he can speak and create out of nothing everything that we have here. Is that a powerful God? I have to have an understanding of the power of God, and it has to be sufficient for me to commit my life to following him. I need to know that he's all-powerful. The second event in scripture that was so important for the people of Israel, and so they they appealed to the creation uh, time and time again, as we've seen here in Psalm chapter 33. But uh, when you stop and you think about creation, that's one aspect. But I also want to make mention of the fact that when the apostle Paul is preaching to a group of people who are absolutely ignorant of God. He appeals to the creation power. Notice here in Acts chapter 19, if you want to go with me to the book of Acts in the New Testament, I just briefly want to touch on this. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 17 and verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of... uh, the people here, the men of Athos. And he says that I basically can tell that you're religious. There is an inscription that you have to an unknown God. And so you're worshiping, he says, in ignorance. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance. And they fully agreed with this. They didn't know who this unknown God was, but they could sense that there was something that they were missing. And so they have this this statue, and he says, therefore you worship in ignorance, and he says, this is what I'm gonna proclaim to you. 
the God who made the world and all things in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined. You can see where he goes with this. Where is the starting place to talk to people about Jesus Christ and the gospel? Well, if you take this example of the Apostle Paul here in Acts chapter 17, you would understand that you must appeal to God as the creator of the universe. It is insufficient to say that God is the one who just initiated it all uh, with a big bang and everything else has transpired from that. God has to be viewed as the supreme creator of all things. You remember last week when we did the introductory message to the study here in the attributes, I mentioned that oftentimes we are guilty of creating for ourselves the God who we want to serve and we manufacture that God. Unfortunately, we have to, or not really unfortunately, but absolutely in an imperative, we must come to the scriptures and we must embrace what the scriptures teach about God. And that is the true God. Anything else colors God in such a way as to diminish who he truly is. And so when you think of God and you think of him as creator, it is absolutely important that you don't alter that in any way. Secondly, God is also very, very powerful, and it was demonstrated during the Exodus. It is amazing that when you stop and you think about the Exodus, how God worked all of that out. He selects Moses. Moses is going to lead the people out of Egypt. Remember, these are God's chosen people. And he appeals to Pharaoh and he says, you know, let my people go. And what did Pharaoh say? Absolutely no way. And so these plagues come about that are demonstrating the power of God. And Egypt is sent reeling. I mean, you have this most powerful country in the world and it is absolutely brought to its knees by Almighty God. And you come to the point where the people of Israel have escaped and they're running uh, for their lives, basically, and the Egyptians are following them. And then the Bible tells us that it was incredible, but the people of Israel would witness the dead bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the shores of the Red Sea. God delivered the people. And not only does God deliver the people here with regard to the Exodus, but he continues to deliver the people. Take your Bible and go with me to Numbers chapter 11. It's all part of the Exodus. It's all part of, of all the things that are transpiring. As you know, the people of Israel are kind of grouchy, right? I mean, they're kind of grouchy. They're a little bit rough at times. And uh, they were tired of eating manna. They had so much manna, and the Bible describes how they cooked it. They cooked it every which way you possibly could, and they were tired of it. Now, it was the one thing that they could eat out there in the wilderness. There wasn't any other choice. So the people became like those who complained, verse 1, of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. When the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of them on the outskirts of the camp. Well, Moses hears the people, and they're complaining about what they have to eat. I'm flipping the page here and, and going over to verse 18, where God says uh, to Moses, Tell the people to consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat. For we were well off in Egypt. Therefore, he says, you'll get meat to eat. Not one day, not two days, not five days, 10 days or 20, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. You're gonna eat this meat for 30 days and it is going to become disgusting to you. You want meat? I'm going to give you meat. Now, the Bible tells us that the anger of the Lord was, was upon these people. But when God told Moses that he was going to provide meat, Moses' reaction was what? Verse 21, Moses said, the people among whom I, I am are 600,000 on foot. Yet you have said, I will give them meat so that they may eat for a whole month. Should flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to be sufficient for them? 
what's Moses saying? He's basically saying, we're going to have to slaughter a whole lot of animals. And folks, listen, there weren't any animals. And then we're going to have to get a lot of fish out of the sea. And they weren't really near the sea. So that wasn't an option either. And basically he's saying to God, I don't know how you're going to do this, God. It seems pretty much impossible to me. And the Lord answers him in verse 23 and says, is the Lord's power limited? Now you're going to see whether my word will come true for you or not. And I'll tell you this. A wind came forth in verse 31 and brought quail from the sea, and they fell beside the camp. And they had so much quail that in 30 days they were pretty sick of it. God is not limited in his power at all. But he is capable of doing all of these things. In Jeremiah chapter 32, the prophet Jeremiah, as he recounts the great power of God, says this. I'm in Jeremiah 32, verses 17 through 21. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by the great, thy great power and by thy outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for thee who shows loving kindness to thousands but repays the iniquities of fathers into the bosom of their children after them. O great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name, great in counsel, mighty indeed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds, who has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even to this day, both in Israel and among mankind, and thou hast made a name for thyself as at this day, and thou didst bring thy people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders and with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm with great terror and gave them the land which they did swear to their forefathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. Thou hast made the heavens, he says, the heavens and the earth by great power. You have taken the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt showing these great signs and these great wonders. You see, in Jeremiah's time, when Jeremiah was prophesying to the people to remember the great power of God, remember whose people you are, he was appealing to the very powerful nature of Almighty God. Don't forget it, he says. When we come to the New Testament, we see the power of God continuing. The New Testament examples of the power of God first begin here with the miraculous ministry of Jesus Christ. I think of the time when John the Baptist was asking about Jesus. He was asking about him, having some second thoughts, and Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are rised, raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. Now, Jesus makes it very clear in his ministry as he does all these miracles that he has the power to save. Now that's exciting, isn't it? Take your Bible, go with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 uh, is one of those very significant passages in the New Testament. As Jesus deals with a question that is, is brought up to him in verse 1, it says there in verse 1, as Jesus got into a boat, he crossed over the sea and came to his own city, and they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, it's an interesting thing to say. It's very interesting to say. And he makes that statement to them because he has the power to be able to forgive this young man his sins. And that's all important. You say, but he's a paralytic. He's not able to walk. He's not able to, to get up. Why, why doesn't Jesus meet that need first? It's because Jesus is meeting here the most important need that a person has in their life. And that is their need for salvation. Their need for faith in Christ. And so Jesus makes that statement. Now, when he makes that statement, they go ballistic. And some of the scribes said to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said this, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? What is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Let me ask you that question. 
what's easier? What's easier to say? Oh, your sins are forgiven. Or get up and walk. Well, it's much easier to say, get a, you know, your sins are forgiven, right? Because who would really know if your sins are forgiven? Did God really forgive your sins? I can tell you your sins are forgiven. You can tell me my sins are forgiven. I could say that God for, has forgiven me all of my sins. What's easier to say? So that Jesus turns to this paralytic and he says, so that you might know that the Son of Man has authority or power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately this, this man, lame from his birth, a paralytic, unable to walk, is able to stand up, roll up the mat that he's been laying on, tuck it under his arm, and say, thank you, Jesus. Now, most importantly, his sins are forgiven, so he's going to spend his eternity in heaven. But if Jesus can say your sins are forgiven, back that up, and so that's what Jesus did. He backs it up, and he says, look at what I just did. Here's a miracle. This man is able to walk now. What is easier to say? Well, certainly, your sins are forgiven, but look at the power of God as it's demonstrated. And so Jesus' ministry is all about demonstrating this power to be able to forgive us our sins. The resurrection comes, ultimate power of God. Jesus would say, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. In John chapter 10 and verse 17 and 18, verse 18 says, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I, I, this, this that I've done, he says, I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again this commandment I received from my Father. In Romans chapter one and verse four, it says, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is all powerful. Is he going to be able to conquer death? Is he going to be able to demonstrate that sin has no power over him? After taking upon himself your sin and my sin, the sins of the world, he comes forth from the grave and he's victorious and his victory over sin is demonstrated and it's demonstrating further the ability to save people like you and me. Power of God. Last but not least is the power of the transformed life. God's power lives on in the lives of his saints. Romans chapter 12, in the second part of this application, Romans chapter 12, I'm looking here at verse 2. We know verse 1 pretty well. It says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mem of God or the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your uh, reasonable service, it says in the King James. And do not be conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Believers are no longer to conform themselves to the present age. There is a change in the life of the Christian. There's a lasting change that begins not externally. And this is the amazing power of God as demonstrated in the life of the believer. The believer's life according to the scriptures, changes, but it changes from the inside out. Once you place your faith in Jesus Christ, your relationship to sin will change. Not may change, it will change. The transformation will be real. And the Bible tells us that that lasting change is part of the transformation here that Paul is speaking about. A renewed mind is concerned with issues of life that are of lasting importance. We've come to the place where we're no longer uh, just uh, living in a, a temporal mode. Our attitude towards sin changes. We become repentant and we understand that there is a, a change that happens in our life as we address the sin that is a part of our life prior to our salvation. And we begin to reject those things and we embrace the holiness of Christ. Now, one of the things that is a living testimony to the entire world is the testimony of people who are putting their faith in Jesus Christ. It is a transforming power. In China, they don't know what to do. 
with Christianity. Communism came in, as you're very well aware, and Confucianism wasn't even acceptable among the communists. And so it created this enormous vacuum and they saw how it changed their society over time and has been changing it. Do you know what the communists are seeking to do now? They're seeking to bring back Confucianism. Why? Because Confucianism as a religion had an impact on society. All the while they're witnessing Christianity and they're thinking to themselves, this could totally revolutionize our society and culture. And so they're opposed to Christianity because they see it as a threat to Chinese culture. That's the way the power of the gospel explodes on the scene. Someone in your home comes to faith in Christ. Isn't it amazing how that one person can change the dynamic of your home? All of a sudden, your home is very, very different. There's talk about Jesus. There's a different change in actions and behaviors. There's a different mindset towards sin. All of a sudden, things that used to be funny and acceptable maybe no longer are. Life begins to change. Folks, this is the power of the gospel. If you want to see the power of God at work today, look into the hearts of the followers of Jesus Christ. This is what is so wonderful. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 lists this huge list of sins. And, and there's the sin of fornication and adultery. And, and he goes on with thieves and covetous and all these sins. And he says, and such were some of you, past tense. Your life has been changed because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the power of the gospel is something that is absolutely real. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for he says it is the power of God. It is the power of God. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 tells us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. As a believer, you are equipped now in a very, very different way. And the way you live life amidst life's circumstances, good and bad, has an influence in this world power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is, has affected countries like the United States in great ways, hasn't it? It's affected families. It affected you personally. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, we have this treasure, he says, in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. It's all about the power of God. You see, this God who created the world by speaking it into existence, who, who drew his people miraculously with signs and wonders out of Egypt and set them in a new promised land. And we look at the conquest of Joshua and all that God had done there. There was no question. It was all about the power of God. God is all powerful. And as Jesus comes on the scene, we see him walking on the water and healing the sick and doing all of these miracles. We see the ultimate with the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and now in the lives of the disciples, we see the power of God. I don't know what our lives would be like if Jesus Christ hadn't transformed us. But it wouldn't look like we are today. The power of God lives on. The people in China are sharing their faith even though they have the potential to spend time in prison. Why is the gospel growing in China and not like it is here in the United States? Is the problem with the gospel? Has the gospel been diluted? I would submit to you that the problem is the gospel is not being shared here like it's being shared there. You see, you and I need to understand the power of God. We look around, we see our culture in a disarray. We see all the problems in a society that is shutting out God and we wonder where the power of God is. But my friends, listen, the power of God has not been diminished. It is still there. And you, as you walk from this place, 
give testimony to the power of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you. For truly, Lord, we are blessed by the power that's been demonstrated in this world that we live in today. How we thank you, Father, that you are indeed all-powerful. When we come to pray to you, Lord, we know that you're able to hear our prayer and answer our prayer according to your will. Your arms are not shortened, you're not powerless, but you are strong and mighty. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning who's unsure of where they're going to spend their eternity, may they come to the almighty God. And may they place faith in Jesus the Christ and know that their sins have been forgiven. How I pray that that would be true this day. May you be glorified as we follow you together in Jesus' name. Amen.